Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is series is a wonderful series on the Book of Romans. This is lesson number five in that series for November 4 of 2017 entitled, The Faith of Abraham. Now I remember that the faith of Abraham is discussed quite a lot in the Bible, so this ought to be a really good subject, right? Let's, before we jump into it, however, I hope you have your Bible handy, let's have a word of prayer together. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we study this very important subject mentioned repeatedly in Scripture, help us to comprehend something of what that faith of Abraham was like, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's start out by looking at what they say in the first paragraph of our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. It says, in many ways, Romans 4, which is the main subject of this lesson, gets to the foundation of the biblical doctrine of salvation by faith alone. So the clear focus of this lesson is on justification by faith alone. We should note, however, that the word alone is not in the original Greek. That was added by Martin Luther in his first German translation. So what do we mean when we say salvation by faith alone? Is that clear in everybody's mind? Well, let's, let's look at a few verses that will help us understand some of the issues. Of course, the key verse that started the whole thing is found back in Genesis 15, verse 6. Abram put his trust in the Lord, and because of this, the Lord was pleased with him and accepted him. Abraham put his trust in the Lord, and because of this, the Lord was pleased with him and accepted him. Does that mean that um, God just did some magic on him, or was Abraham really changed? That's the, that's the real intent of what we have to discuss here. Uh, it's interesting to notice that in the Greek New Testament, which is, of course, the original language of the New Testament, Paul uses the word logizomai to describe that transaction. Abraham trusted God, and it was accounted, or whatever, logizomai to Abram. The Greek lexicon or dictionary goes out of its way to point out that this word means it is really so. So how does that fit with our idea that someone just pronounces it so, but it may not be really so? Well, if salvation is by faith alone, then the trust that Abraham placed in God's promises of an heir were sufficient in God's eyes, and probably in the light of the rest of the evidence that God knew about the life of Abraham, that he could be trusted as a future citizen of heaven. So how does God decide that Joe Blow, or whatever his name is, is safe to have in heaven for the rest of eternity? That would be the question. God knows what that person is really like, what his okay. true motives are, mm -hmm. what his underlying character is like. So in light of that, why, what did God, why did God pick Abraham? Or Abram, as it was in those days? He was one of the few left who were still faithful to God in, in those days. And, and he came from a family that was already pagan. They were worshiping idols. Mm -hmm. yeah, the Lord went to and fro through all the earth looking for someone whose heart is perfect towards yeah. him. So obviously it worked out. He uh, chose Abraham and Abraham uh, believed and responded and followed him and left uh, some some His months family. ago, yeah, some months ago we were talking about Abraham and what he really did here, and I maybe I should have brought the quotation here, but we often think of Abram with, you know, his wife Sarah after Hagar and Ishmael were thrown out, or, or at least asked to leave, and we see the three of them, father, mother, and son, and they're sitting around a fire maybe or something. And we we have those kind of pictures. Ellen White says that Abraham, and we remember in contrast to that, that when, when there was a problem down in the valley of Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot was taken captive along with a whole lot of other people, what did Abraham do? 
he got his warriors together and went out and attacked and how many them. of them were there? Do you remember? Like Several 300. hundred. 318 trained soldiers. So what were those 318 trained soldiers doing the rest of the time? Guarding the flocks. Probably guarding Abraham's flocks. So now, all together, how many people did you think he had? Ellen White says that he had in his household a thousand heads of households that he period on regularly trained how to trust God and so forth like this. So uh, those mother, father, and son pictures probably didn't happen very often. <laughs> I mean, he's training a thousand people. I mean, how many pastors have started a church from, from ground zero and had a thousand heads of households? That's not to say how many there were all together. A thousand heads of households. Well, so what did Abraham do? He trusted God's word that he would be giving an heir. Now let's talk about how that worked out. First of all, look at Genesis 17, verse 17. Abraham bowed down. When he, God came to him and says, I'm going to give you a son. Abraham bowed down with his face, touching the ground, but he began to laugh when he thought, can a man have a child when he's 100 years old? Can Sarah have a child <coughs> at 90? He asked God, why not let Ishmael be my heir? So do you... Uh, become trusted by God by laughing when God tells you something? It's questionable. Well, if you're, if you're, you've been thinking that God is going to bless things in a very natural way. In other words, mm -hmm. Sarah's going to have the child and they go on for 10 years and nothing happens and then they, uh, we're, I'm contrasting the natural versus the supernatural here because mm -hmm. uh, Sarah was no longer the natural uh, person to carry this on, so then he got Hagar, which yeah. again was following sort of a natural yep. progression of things. But when, uh, uh, but God had to do something supernatural in order yeah. to for Sarah to conceive. But what, what do you think he did? Why did he laugh? I mean, did he laugh at God, or did he laugh I at mean, the whole idea? You're, so, you're a lot younger than I am, but you know, <laughs> when you get to be my age, you say, uh, your wife is going to have a baby, and I'm saying, let's see, which book of yeah, physiology but, did but you what study? If, <laughs> what if he did really believe him, and then he just imagined him having a baby at that age, and what everybody else would think? Yeah. So there's two but ways when, you when can God, look at it. Either... You know, God, you're crazy. I'm just laughing at you. Or he really believed it and said, and just started imagining everybody knowing, looking at him with a baby. Okay. So, well, okay. So there's two we, ways to look at it. We go one chapter later. We go to Genesis 18, starting with verse 9. And this is what happened a few months later. Then they asked him, This is Abraham and Sarah. Well, it's Abraham. Sarah is hiding behind in the tent, listening, overhearing the conversation. They're sitting outside enjoying the meal. Then they asked him, where is, where is your wife Sarah? She's there in the tent, he answered. So there's no question about that. One of them said, nine months from now, I will come back and your wife Sarah will have a son. Sarah was behind him at the door of the tent listening. Abraham and Sarah were very old and Sarah had stopped having her monthly periods. So Sarah laughed to herself and said, now that I'm old and why not can I still enjoy sex? And besides, my husband is old too. Then the Lord asked Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, can I really have a child when I'm so old? Now, how did she say this? Is she announcing it to the community? No, she's thinking this in her head. She's not saying a word. Okay? She said, laugh to herself. Laugh to herself, yeah. Is anything too hard for the Lord? As I said, nine months from now, I will return and Sarah will have a son. Okay? So they because Sarah was afraid, she denied it. So now she's not only laughing at what God told her, she's denying that she laughed about it. I didn't laugh, she said. Yes, you did, he replied, you laughed. And of course, you know the result of all that. But you got to remember, the Bible says that she was afraid. Yeah. She was afraid. So the that question comes right then, why was she afraid? <laughs> yeah. The thing that what I wonder about here, and I've thought about it often, but I've never heard any real thought about it had humanity deteriorated 
to the parameters you just mentioned in our day and age, mm -hmm. had it deteriorated that far in their time? I mean, this was thousands of years ago. Yeah, well, and, and all of that's fine, but it's very clear that she stopped having periods. So physiologically, she can't have a baby. Right. It, by any rules that we know about, okay? So the question we need to ask ourselves, because this, this, this lesson is about the, the trust of Abraham. So what does trust mean in the context, oh, by the way, what did they name their baby? Laughter. 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 <laughs> <laughs> There's got to be some kind of in, in, interesting story behind that. Somebody, so what I, I read uh, something that the, uh, that humor comes from a surprise to yeah. the mind. Exactly. So if your thoughts is it, is are it, on a natural, out, you know, method of this coming about, and it suddenly there's this supernatural. Yeah. thing and and we you know Nicodemus Jesus told Nicodemus that you must be born again and his mind immediately went to the natural yeah. explanation you know can I go back into my mother's womb and be born again you know uh, and and we're we're prone to do that I mean you don't go into the office and so somebody comes in and you think oh this person needs to be exercised you know let's let's have an exorcism he's demon possessed you that isn't the first thing you think about. You have to be careful how you say that. Exercise is one thing. Exorcise. Exorcise, yeah. <laughs> okay. But but we we tend to na navigate mo mostly on the natural, and yeah. the danger would be that then with salvation that we try to interpret or define it yeah. in natural terms, whether it's legalism or so uh, or uh, uh, well a legal. Uh, answer to the thing, you know, yeah. that you're just uh, forgiven or something. Well, somehow or other, Abraham's trust in God includes laughing at God, and your wife laughing at God, and both of them are, are clearly presented as examples of faith in Hebrews 11. Both of them, not just Abraham. Well, going on, in, in Romans 4, this is from our Bible study guide again. In Romans 4, Paul reveals three major stages in the plan of salvation. One, the promise of divine blessing, or the promise of grace. Two, the human response to that promise, the response of faith. And three, the divine pronouncement of righteousness credited to those who believe that is justification. That's how it worked with Abraham, and that's how it works with us. Okay? So, back to our question. Is this a legal transaction that takes place in the books of heaven? I can remember as a child being taught that every day as I'm going about my activities, every time I sin, my sins are written in the books of heaven. And then if I get down by my bed at night time and pray God for forgiveness, then those sins are erased from the books, and that means that someday when my judgment comes up, God looks at the book and there's nothing there at all, no sins left there, then I can be saved. Is that the way it works? It, by, by many people have approached it, but that has nothing to do with it. It's not, it's not a legal issue. It never has been. It's not legal problems or an exchange in the nature of a contract. It still doesn't work. It's neither well, one of those what things. What happens when you do have faith? What is happening when you have faith? Okay, that's a very good question, and here's a part of the answer. If you go back to Romans 3, verse 4, it says in the King James Version, we'll go to the more traditional translation, Romans 3, 4, God forbid, yea, let God be true, by, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings. Talking about who? God. God. God needs to be justified and mightest overcome when thou art judged. So in Romans 3, it says God needs to be justified. Well, another so way whatever could, we're saying here, justification has to include God. Or you, you can say it's the same uh, Greek word. May by you the way. be uh, shown to be right in your yeah. in your judgment. Okay. Right? okay. Justified. Uh, we get into the idea of legal. Okay. Is 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 God shown to be right because he is right, or just because he declares it so? Because he is right, as a declaration. 
God can be right, but he ha if he hasn't convinced everybody, anybody else, then... What's he accomplished? Yeah, what's he accomplished? And the, that's why he, the ultimate demonstration was, uh, was coming down here living and, and ultimately dying. Yeah. But if nobody's listening in a vacuum or, or, a, or in a cell someplace, who's going to know what's, uh, what's going well, on? My Good News Bible puts it this way, which I like. Certainly not. God, you know, King James says, God forbid. Certainly not. God must be true even though every human being is a liar. As the scripture says, you must be shown to be right. When you speak, you must win your case when you are being tried. So there you go, Psalm Jim. 51 shown, four, isn't it? Shown, yeah, yeah, well, it came from, comes from Psalm someplace, I don't know. 51, yeah. yeah. So in what sense does God need to be justified? You know, on that point, they have the text there, what it's referring to back to Psalm 51, and yet many translations mess it up the second half. May you make the right judgment. Mm -hmm. As if God can't figure things out, but well, we sure hope he does, you know, by hook or by crook. Okay, well, the Greek word translated justify is dikaiao. Uh, many people are aware of that. But scholars have done an interesting thing when translating that word. Dikaios is translated as righteous. Adikos, the negative form, is translated unrighteous. Dikaiosune is translated righteousness. But when scholars translate the verb form of this word, they say justify. Why is that? We need a word rightify. Well, we don't have a rightify word. But in the history of Christianity, the gospel moved west. And Rome became the headquarters of the Christian church. So they eventually wanted the Bible to be in Latin. Jerome spent years translating the Bible into Latin, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And he did a marvelous job. It's a great translation into Latin, if you read Latin. That version has come, to, has come to be known as the Vulgate. In Latin, the word for right is justidia, from which we get justify. So in the verb form, it means to be put right, set right, or made right. So we've got right, unright, righteous, unrighteous, righteousness, justify. You know, all these legal terms that, that are being used, somewhat based of, because of the wrong or the false presupposition, the presupposition that should be used that sin is a disease. Mm -hmm. And if it's a disease, God says, I'm your healer. Mm -hmm. uh, all, many th places, places through the Old Testament. But you don't get that when, you, when you're wrestling words of, of righteous and, and well, justice. Well, isn't that, isn't that kind of talking about, when you talk about disease, that's a physiological thing. Well, it's your thinking. Your, is, is yeah, I know, but, but when you talk about justification, aren't mm -hmm. you talking about what's right, um, the truth? Mm -hmm. So well, if, you, if you don't have the truth, and then you have the truth, does that mean that you're being healed there? Yeah. Or is, or is it just that you're changing your mind? But that's, it. that's a part of the process of healing, your brain. Yeah, you have to, if you want to be right with God and you want to live with Him forever, you have to have a correct understanding of His character and a, agreement. You need to be in agreement with what He, he, well, what he is. Well, I know that. I'm just using yeah. the two processes here of of changing your mind versus being healed. Yeah. So I, I, well, I'm not, trying that's exactly. to mesh, mesh those together, and they, they're do, they don't quite mesh together for me. For well, sometimes reason. people will speak of a diseased mind, and they just mean somebody who's really gone off the tracks mentally. Mm -hmm. um, so as opposed to an infectious but process. That's not, that's not from reason. That's from some problem in your cells or whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, and so, so and, okay, but you see what you, you're, you, you're making an excellent point, so let's, let's, let's see. Is sin a disease that needs to be healed, or is it just a legal record that needs to be erased? If somebody declares, well, you're, we'll let you go this time, or somebody paid the penalty for you. All the false, a false paradigm which has infected theology for well, I a couple think thousand I, years anyway. I, I think it depends on what you thought, you think the original state of yeah. things were, you know. Yeah. Uh, if we are, were made to be connected to God, mm -hmm. the vital connection Ellen White refers to, then there's a supernatural element in we must be born again. In other words, it's not just 
getting uh, correct information in our head. It's it's having a relationship. Paul yeah. said all the stuff that I about me that's earthly, you know, I counted as rubbish for the sake of knowing. And it's not knowing about Jesus, it's knowing him personally. Yeah. And Good. that's what salvation is about, is restoring that relationship with God. Yeah, you I, I was going to go back to Romans uh, 3, verse 4. Yeah. Not at, um, every man a liar? Yeah. No, I think that the text is really saying, is every man believing falsehood? Yeah. And that's the problem with humanity. It's not that we're liars. Those little lies don't really amount to a whole lot. It's believing a falsehood that is a problem. But what if you're actually evangelizing people by telling them lies? Well, it is a lie, as Jim was pointing out, to say that we are saved by doing right or by being <coughs> having our sins paid for on the cross. That is a dangerous thing to affirm because we can't really f point to any Bible text to say that. Mm -hmm. We are saved because we have the faith of Jesus, which is the belief system, system of Jesus. Exactly. Well, it's well, a connection to God, to the Which Father. is that, yeah. exactly. It's, it's not just a, an organization of information. It's a connection well, with the, the source of that information. But the information has to come first. Yeah. Mm. The, the, yeah. No. The interesting thing in the case of Abraham is that he ends up being called God's <laughs> friend. So what happens from to, what what needs to happen for a, a sinner to become God's friend? I mean, because that's that's what happened to Abraham. So if we could figure out what happened to Abraham, that should give us a clue, right? Well, can somebody be a friend if you're not agreed with that person? Abraham agreed with God, yeah. therefore he was a friend. And, and of course, you know, the Bible clearly says, can two walk together unless they be agreed? Yeah. yeah. It is interesting to notice in Genesis 26, verse 5, it says, God said, I will bless you because Abraham obeyed, now he's talking to Isaac about his father, I will bless you because Abraham obeyed me and kept all my laws and commands. Was that before Sinai or after Sinai? Long before. And obeyed him, take instruction. He was willing to listen to God, and uh, the God can teach him. But if nobody wants, if the person doesn't want to listen, what can you do with him? And this was hundreds of years before of Sinai. Yeah. Well, we know that Abraham lied. He lied about his wife to Pharaoh. He lied about his wife to uh, Abimelech. He weren't both both those cases before he became Abraham? Yes. I think that we need to make a clear distinction between Abram and Abraham. Yep. One comes after the circumcision or at the same time as the yep. circumcision, which is significant. I think we need to consider that more closely. Mm -hmm. But when did faith come? No. From what he had learned from God, which led to the circumcision. He was he Abram or Abraham? No, he, it was way back. It was Abram. It was Abram. Well, then, what kind of faith is that, that you get to the point where you lie? It was before he lied. It, it was, was before he lied. I know. But say that he has faith. Mm -hmm. That means he trusts in God, right? Mm -hmm. So why would he have to lie? Because he's... Well, he, he still didn't trust he wasn't God perfect. completely. He wasn't perfect. But, uh, Hebrews but, 11, but it just seems so easy. Anybody could do that. Yeah. I mean, what, what is so good about him if he was mentioned as the person, the father of faith? See, we, we have to remember that he was living at a time when he didn't have the Old Testament or the New. <laughs> he didn't have a okay? pastor. He didn't have problem. anything. That's yeah, right. that, that's true. But, you know, faith is faith. When, when somebody has faith, oh. the concept should be the same whether you have the Bible or not. And it's a process. Because they were, they were, they were talking about it then. But he, he did have the advantage of having God coming and talking to him on a periodic basis. That probably yeah, made some Yeah, but God's different. the one that judged that he had faith. Yeah. So he was willing he to listen. Known, yeah. He should have, should have known what was going to happen in the future, and still so, he was but, called, okay. he was, so, still had faith. Okay, let me use your argument. That means... We have all of Scripture, and we hear a Seventh-day Adventist of all Ellen White's writings, so therefore we should never sin because we have all this evidence before us, right? 
Well, I'm not talking about evidence. I'm talking about <laughs> no, trust. No, we're talking. I'm talking about but trust. But the trust is God. based on evidence. But trust grows. It's a relationship. <laughs> you, you, you know, if you meet somebody, you might extend a measure of trust, and as you get to walk with so them and do things. So a grain of a grain of faith would have been all that was needed for him to be judged the father of faith. Got to start to be, someplace. To begin, we all start. That's where we all start. To the extent it's that we can God, trust him, God knew something that we don't. Well, it's, it's about Abraham. The job too. Yeah, it, that's it, yeah. true. But we're, we're studying him to try to figure out what's going on. Yeah. That's very true. Well, we got it in Hebrews eleven eight. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called. In other words, he listened to God's instruction. Then you go down another verse here. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise. Uh, well, yeah. coming down to to the point here, I mean, Abraham, obviously, the, the ultimate test of faith that most people point to was the time he's ready to offer his son Isaac. And we'll get to that in a little bit later. But we are twisted up now a little bit because of, of Martin Luther and others. Martin Luther was a trained lawyer way before he be, had anything to do with Christianity. He was preoccupied with the law. This brings us to a question which has raised <coughs> many times on this subject. Does God declare that we are savable because we are, or are we savable because God declares it? If, uh, how does the divine pronounce, uh, pronouncement actually affect us? Does it matter how sinful we were before God made such a pronouncement? <coughs> we've already talked about Romans 3, 4, and he goes on at the end of that chapter and talks about, okay, what happens here? The death of the life and death of Christ, if I can use a very free paraphrase of Roman, the, those Ro Romans 3, 24, and 25, and 26, the life and death of Jesus demonstrates God's righteousness. And he says that three times, and then at the end he says, oh, by the way, he also makes us right if he's righteous. So um, does that possibly suggest that God's righteousness is more important than ours? Well, his is the, he's the source of all righteousness. Yeah. So, obviously, he's the... Well, we're kind of acting like Jesus has a can of something and he's just handing it out to everybody, this righteousness. But what I if you not. look at it like <coughs> Jesus is like a, a light, mm. a a a thing to follow mm -hmm. will then and reflect hopefully then, well to follow you just assume mm -hmm. that you'll reflect him if you're following mm -hmm. that he's at, in that case we are taking something from him mm -hmm. by following him so what do we do with Paul's comment at the end of that whole discussion does this mean that, this is Romans 3.31, does this mean that by this faith we do away with the law? No, not at all. Instead, we uphold the law. So now, Paul almost seems to be contradicting himself. It is depends, he or? It depends how we understand the word faith. If the word faith is understood as trust, as we've just been saying it, we have a problem. The word faith means a belief system. Do we have the belief system of Christ or do we not? Mm -hmm. Are we studying the belief system of Christ, which is entirely focused on serving and helping others? Yeah. It makes all the difference in how we live. We clearly have the words in First John, who was written by, that's written by Jesus' closest disciple, saying, God is love. And Jesus, he said it twice. And Jesus lived to exemplify that. Is that the way we live our lives? That's the question. Well, we, we can look historically that when we've already mentioned this, the problem was made, I mean, the promise was made to Abram at the time way before he was circumcised, any of that stuff. But then he, his name was changed at the time he was circumcised, or right about that same time, apparently to signify that he had entered a new relationship with God, a better relationship with God. So um, we need to notice three things. 
This famous promise was made to Abraham before or Abram it was, before the law as we know it was given at Sinai, Exodus 23 to 17. Furthermore, too, Abraham was descended from a group of pagan idol worshippers, Joshua 24, 2. And three, Abraham had not yet been circumcised, Genesis 17, 10 to 14, and 23 to 27. So the people who were harassing, mean, well, maybe I shouldn't call them harassing, but the people who were trying to tell the Galatians that Paul was writing to at the same time that you can't really be a Christian unless you get circumcised and you do all these other things. Abraham was justified by God before he was circumcised. He was not a Jew. That didn't come until his great-grandchildren were born. So, David decided as another example of faith. We don't have time to spend a lot of time on his story, but you know what he did with Bathsheba. He did other things, lots of other crazy things. So why is David cited as an example of faith? Can you think of something in his life that would make David an example of faith? When he was young, he was said to be a man after God's own heart. Yeah. And then, of course, with the thing with Bathsheba, he repented when he was rebuked for it. Yes, yeah. we have Psalm 51. In several places where he made mistakes, as soon as it was pointed out, he immediately said, no, I'm, I want to be in, in line with God. I want to get back. I'm sorry. I, I repent. So that's a, that's, that's a clue. Another thing we see is uh, growth and transformation mm -hmm. over time in the life of David. And uh, if he was after God's own heart, it's because God knew where he was going to go with his life. Well, it's very easy to allow religion to become focused on our behavior. You know, you go to church and you want to see that everybody else is in church behaving kind of like you do, and you want to make sure that you're dressed like them, more or less. You don't want to go... I've heard a story one time about a, a man who started attending a Christian church wearing overalls, kind of, kind of messy, not that clean, and so forth, and he kept coming and... And the church opened their arms and welcomed him. And he kept coming and he kept coming. And finally he decided, I, I would like to baptize and join the, this church. And they were so happy. They welcomed him and so forth. So the day came for his baptism and he showed up in a three-piece suit. And he said, where did you get? It turns out he was a wealthy businessman. He just wanted to make sure that the church would accept him because of what he believed and not because of the way he was dressed. I thought was quite a good test. Well, here's something that was included in our lesson. Let's, let me repeat this. The sinner must come in faith to Christ, take hold of his, so come to Christ in faith, take hold of his merits, lay his sins upon the sin bearer, receive his pardon. It was for this cause that Christ came into the world, thus the righteousness of Christ is imputed to the repenting, believing sinner. He becomes a member of the royal family, a child of the heavenly king, an heir of God, and joint heir with Christ. Review and Herald, April 5, 1898, and repeated in some of like the mentions is book one. So, if faith is just a word we use to describe a relationship with Jesus Christ, how does one come in faith to Christ? How does one take hold of his merits? What are Christ's merits? Now, you know that our Roman Catholic friends have that all worked out. They believe that some people, well, they believe that when, uh, in the judgment, God has a balance. And if you have more good deeds than bad deeds, then you're going to be saved. If you have more bad deeds than good deeds, you're going to be lost. Well, they believe that some people have a, quite an excess of good deeds. And of course, Jesus would have more excess of good deeds than anyone else. And so he has enough extra merits that he can give those to other people and they can, they can use them to help balance their scales. Is that the way it works? And we get oh, those we, merits by paying money? Well... Doing things? Doing things. You can even get other people out of purgatory by doing certain things. Well, we can come boldly before the throne of grace to find help in time of need. It's, it's really about coming to God, and we can do that in Christ. We can behold the face, uh, the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So uh, 
if we were left to ourselves, we would be consumed in God's presence, mm -hmm. even to some lesser measure. But in Christ, we can uh, his his uh, access, if it, if you want to put it that way, to God uh, allows us to to get close to God. Okay. So that could be a sense of merit. So well, we could talk directly to God, can't we? We right. yeah. need to have an inter uh, assessor from that point of view. Well, and, 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 and let's, let's come right down to where the rubber meets the road. The word for salvation in Greek means healing. So whatever we're talking about here, the result has to be healing. So how does that happen? If you don't spend any time learning, studying, contemplating on, on the on the issue of God, eternal life is to know the Father and Jesus Christ to Him be sent. That's what Jesus said just before He died. So, uh, and and there's no other explanation as to the meaning for His death that, that uh, we can find in the Bible. Well, we're try trying to heal that relationship. Uh, our wills have been corrupted and resist doing the will of God, which is what Jesus came to do. I came to do the will of the Father. And so it, part of that is that it's, uh, as we behold, uh, our wills are softened so that we're able to respond to his, his spirit uh, more, uh, more uh, now, con you, consistently. Yeah. There's word. We know, let's just be honest about this, many Christian theologians have looked at this dilemma, how does this all work, and suggested that the solution is a legal transaction. The perfect record of Christ's life on this earth is copied and credited to our account. Thus it looks like we have lived such a life. If God does that, is he deceiving himself? Because he's the judge, right? Yes, he is. There is no text that really proves that point. Mm -hmm. Is there? That, that he's the judge? That no, no, that uh, his righteousness replaces ours. Oh, no, there isn't. So is God trying to pull the wool over the eyes of the universe? No, Absolutely he's just trying not. To, I'm sorry. No, I'm, go ahead. He's just trying to get close to us, and, yeah. and Christ allows us to get closer to him. So he's, he's sort of the shield or the step-down transformer, if you want to yeah. look at it that way, that allows us to get close to him. Ellen White lived about half as far away from Martin Luther as we do. And she looked at this legal religion, this idea, and this is what she said. A legal religion can never lead souls to Christ, for it is a loveless, Christless religion. Fasting or prayer that is actuated by a self-justifying spirit is an abomination in the sight of God. The solemn assembly for worship, the round of religious ceremonies, the external humiliation, the imposing sacrifice, proclaim that the doer of these things regards himself as righteous. And I can remember when some, someone came to one of our churches here in La Melinda and said he was going to arrive in heaven someday and he was going to claim his right to be there. Jeffrey Paxton. Yeah, well, we don't need to mention any names probably. He, although he was not an Adventist, I can say. No. I was there when he, when he just said that. Mm -hmm. Well, these, these things proclaim that the doer of these things regards himself as righteous and as entitled to heaven, but it is all a deception. Our own works can never purchase salvation. Desire of Ages 280, paragraph 2. Earlier she said this, um, a legal religion can, has been thought quite the correct religion for this time, but it is a mistake. The rebuke of Christ to the Pharisees is applicable to those who have lost from the heart their first love. A cold, legal religion can never lead souls to Christ, for it is a loveless, Christless religion. When fastings and prayers are practiced in a self-justifying spirit, they are abominable to God. The solemn assembly for worship, the round of religious ceremonies, the external humiliation, the imposed sacrifice, all proclaim to the world the testimony of the doer of these things considers himself righteous. These things call attention to the observer of rigorous duties, saying, this man is entitled to heaven, but it is all a deception. Review and Herald, March 20, 1894. So, what's the solution to all of this? Well, for many of our Christian friends, the solution for this problem is to do away with the law. 
If you can't meet the standard, if you can't live up to the standard, then get rid of the standard. Isn't, isn't that a good solution? Certainly not what Paul says. Not what Paul says. Well. God forbid, mm -hmm. as in the um, King James Version. Well, let's ask a question. First John 3, 4 says that sin is a transgression of the law, or more precisely, sin is lawlessness, or law, sin is rebelliousness. So does that mean that if you get rid of the law, you've also gotten rid of sin? Some people, well, that's lawlessness. Some people would say, well, if, you have, if, you, if there's no law to break, and you're not doing it, and you don't have any idea of anything wrong against that law, wouldn't that seem like... See, it all depends what the law implies in, in our understanding of what the law is. If the law is here to tell us what we should do or not do, we have a problem because then we'll try to meet the requirement of a law. Instead of learning to think as Jesus does, which is the faith of Jesus, right. which would lead us to do what the law tells us to do, not because the law says you do it, but because that mindset keeps us from it's the right thing to do. Exactly. Yeah. In fact, yeah. go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, we've talked about the physical law mm -hmm. versus the law that we're reading here. And if you take the physical law and look at it in the same way, you can't change gravity. Mm -hmm. So that I law is still, how to do that yet. the law is still there. Mm -hmm. You can't take it away. Yeah. I think it would apply here the same way. I mean, you can take away that law, but that doesn't mean you can't, you shouldn't. But if, if God could take away the law, if, if there's anybody who could take away the law, it would be God. Yes. So if God could take away the law, then he should be able to save everybody, right? Because nobody would have sinned, because sin is a transgression of the law. You have the issue of freedom. And if people have to, will make a choice, and make that you have to have choice, otherwise you don't have love. If God is love, He can only create intelligent creatures with ha which have the capacity to make a choice. Well, here's what Romans 4:13 says: When God promised Abraham and his descendants that the world would belong to Him, He did so not because Abraham obeyed the law, but because he believed and was accepted as righteous by God. So, did Abraham believe the law? Or did Abraham obey the law or not? Well, remember Told Isaac that Abraham did. Remember well, what Genesis twenty six five says: Abraham obeyed me and kept all my laws and commands. So is Paul confused? Or is he saying that Abraham obeyed the law not as a way of earning salvation, but because it was the right thing to do? Well, Jesus deals with. Uh, with our attitude where he talks about how a slave comes in and uh, it says uh, he the master doesn't say just sit down to eat he says uh, prepare something for me and he goes through that this is uh, Luke 17 mm -hmm. he does not thank the slave because he did the things which are commanded does he so you too when you do all these things which are commanded you say we are unworthy or unprofitable slaves we have done only that which we ought to have done. In other words, you don't owe me anything. I, I just did the, what was supposed to be mm -hmm. uh, done. Well, it's interesting how some other groups have translated this expression from Romans 4, um, especially verse 14. Um, it seems to say that if those who try to keep the law are heirs of salvation, their faith is made void and the promise is useless. Well, here's a couple of other translations. What do you think of these? This is the Jewish New Testament. Now, this would be translated by Jews who now have come to believe in Christianity and, and the, the, in Christ. They say, for if the heirs are produced by legalism, then trust is pointless and the promise worthless. The Message Bible spells it out quite a bit in more detail. What do you think of this? If those who get what God gives them only get it by doing everything they are told to do and filling out all the right forms properly signed. I spent an hour today filling out a government form for a patient. I tell you, 
government forms or something else. So if you earn your salvation by filling out all the right forms properly signed that eliminates personal trust completely and turns the promise into an ironclad contract. That's not a holy promise, that's a business deal. Is that going too far? Well, there are a number of verses in Scripture that um, suggesting that the principal function of the law is to point out sin. Do we need something to point out sin? Well, it gives us a feedback mechanism. We're to follow the light, but some people think they're following the light and, and they're divorcing their spouses, uh, going after another person uh, instead of their their covenant uh, relationship with their spouse or you know people excuse or they're going to out and killing people for <laughs> so the law uh, creates a feedback mechanism that says no you're not walking after the spirit if you're doing these things now some people would say that the law that is talking about here is maybe the ceremonial law that Paul is trying to get rid of the ceremonial law can't be the one Paul is talking about because and I think Paul wrote Hebrews as well. Here it says here in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 3 and 4, As it is, however, the sacrifices serve year after year to remind people of their sins. Okay? You have the law, you follow the law, and what, what is the result? You're reminded of your sins, for the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sins. Now, what it, what you, what's your point there? Because you're you're saying ceremonial law versus the Ten Commandments is that what you're saying? I'm saying I think all law is involved here, oh. all of it. Okay. And, and the ceremonial law can't be what Paul's talking about here because he says it's clear that it 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 never did take away sins. It never was a way of being saved. And that's that we all we're trying to suggest that that applies to all laws, that keeping laws is not a way to salvation. Yeah, I, and you're ca talking about the Ten Commandments here too. Because it's yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm trying law. to include all law. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, I think Paul is really including all legal system. There's no such thing as a legal system that can make us better, mm -hmm. which means that even the law of God can't make us better. Mm -hmm. It can only point to my sins and re help me to recognize that I am a sinner, but it's only the face of Jesus that can save me from being a sinner and failure to observe the law. Yeah. And that, of course, comes by observing him, by reading about him, by learning about him, meditating on his life, praying to him, asking him to guide us through the work of the Holy Spirit and so forth. Those things that lead to a, a relationship. I mean, you know, that's... that's, that's so let's talk for just a couple minutes. We don't have a lot of minutes left. The experience of Abraham when he was 120 years old and he has a son who's 20 years old. And so he gets a message in the middle of the night, go three days journey and offer this young son of yours that's the one of the promise, the son of the promise that's going to be the ancestor of so many generations and kings and all that stuff he's been promised and sacrifice him on that altar. Now, why would God ask him to do such a thing? Does this have something to do with the God counted him as a friend? But what friend would ask him to do that? Well, that's my question. That seems a little ex extreme, doesn't it? It seems like it's not friendly at all. <laughs> okay. That's good. Well, well, Hebrews says that uh, Abraham considered that God could raise him from the dead. So he didn't see Romans, it. written by the same person, says he looked at his body, and he, which he thought was as good as dead. And that was before Isaac was born. He was 11, 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, or you could say tempted. Well, what, what do we do with James 1.13? Yeah. God tempts nobody. Yeah and God cannot be tempted. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we need to look back at the culture where Abraham came from, mm -hmm. and it was a pagan culture, and we go to, to uh, what is it, uh, Micah 6, 6, 
And what shall I offer? Um, yeah. my, my firstborn for my yeah. My or the, the how's it go? Firstborn for the for the sins of my sins soul. Of my soul. Yeah. And but no, God says in the verse eight, all He wants you to do is ho walk humbly with your God. Mm -hmm. Walk humbly with your God means you're willing to listen and take instruction. Yeah. Yeah. So well, why go through all this? Exactly. Good question. Well, I kind of think that the hang-up was not with God, it was with Abraham. Yeah. I think he I hope wondered, we all agree with that. <laughs> well, yeah, but why I think it's that way, you may not agree with. He, he looked at the pagan, pagan culture, saw sacrifices of, 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 of um, children sons and, and children, children and things, and he wondered if he could do that for God. Well, that's not what the text says, though. Yeah, it says God told him to do this. I know, but that's the reason why he did it. I'm not saying that. That's why he's doing it that way. Unfortunately, we have Jeremiah. Or fortunately, we have Jeremiah eight verse eight. Mm -hmm. it says the scribes with their lying pen has made it into a lie. And of course, you get to Matthew twenty three, starting at verse thirteen and following. Following, Jesus said seven times. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. The f scribes and Pharisees were misleading the people. Mm -hmm. well, well, so are you saying Moses misled us with uh, writing uh, We Genesis? don't know that's what Moses wrote there. We're making an assumption that Moses wrote it. Well, if yeah, we're we can rip out a lot of things as... Well, <laughs> as well, yeah. well try to imagine this. What if, what if Abraham actually thought about this? He thought what about if it for he three thought days. No, what if he thought about, even way before this, could I give my son to God? Well, but hold on just a minute. God promised him this son. The son is born by a miracle. No Doesn't question about matter. it. Doesn't matter. And this matter. son is promised to be the, the father of many generations. And it was very important for him. Now, you, he you can't. asks, because all these other pagan people are giving up any, everything for their God, could he possibly give up everything for his God? But that, and that's, that's completely when, contrary to what no, God has no, told No, no, listen, him. listen. I know that. I know that. But I'm just saying that he he's wondering about this. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, he gets this dream mm -hmm. to go sacrifice his son. Mm -hmm. And look at the end, mm -hmm. what he says. Now I know that you won't hold back anything mm -hmm. from me. It's almost like he's, he's confirming to Abraham that he will not do that. Okay, in the last four minutes we've got here, let's, let's, Abraham was willing to lie about his wife. He was willing to take a secondary wife in order to have a son. Those were all mistakes. Now he has the son of the promise, and he's willing to, at this point in time, he says, God, I don't understand why you're asking me to do this, but I have now come to trust your word implicitly, so I'm on my way. Is that faith? Yes. Well, <laughs> well he have, says so. Go ahead. I have come to trust your word implicitly. I am willing to listen to you. That doesn't mean I'll understand everything. Yeah. And I really believe that God misunderstood, I mean, Abraham misunderstood God. Yeah. Because God, when he said, hola, hola, there's nothing in that s Hebrew statement that implies an offering, mm -hmm. nothing there that implies that he should burn him. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. Hola, hola means take him up to the highest of highest. Mm -hmm. Take him up, consecrate him to God, mm -hmm. I think is what God was trying to tell Abraham, who misunderstood in spite of the fact that he should have understood because God had already revealed his personality, his reality to Abraham mm -hmm. at the time of that circumcision. And that should be a subject we talk about a lot more. Gary has asked about what were they thinking in his day. Here's a statement about what they were thinking in Jesus' day. This is the beginning of Desire of Ages. The principle that man can save himself by his own works lay at the foundation of every heathen religion. It had now, in Jesus' day she's talking about, become the principle of the Jewish religion. Satan had implanted this principle. Wherever it is held, 
men, men have no barrier against sin. So, uh, and if you read back through places like Psalm 115, 1 to 8, where she talks about the people who make idols and Isaiah 40 and 44 and lots of other places, and she says, these things are completely crazy. Why would anyone, you know, you take a log and you make half of it, you make a god out of it, and the other half you cook your lunch with it, you know? <laughs> what, what kind of nonsense is that? Well, have you ever thought that you were capable of keeping the Ten Commandments, all ten of them? We're talking about laws now. Shouldn't it be possible to keep ten simple rules? Not if we go by the law. Only if we go by the Spirit of Christ, which is the way He thinks. That's why we need to learn to study Christ in truth. And that's the key word, in truth. Yeah. That means that if you, we have anything that is false about the nature of Christ, the character of Christ, mm -hmm. we're likely to have a flaw in our understanding of our own character mm -hmm. and what it ought to be. Let me read you a few words here in conclusion. If you are a believer, this is just to ask you how you, how you regard these things. If you are a believer and a seek, are seeking to do God's will, what makes you willing to obey? Could you say, I do what I do because God has told me to, and he has the power to reward and destroy? If this is why you don't murder or commit adultery, is, is it because God has said you mustn't? You would otherwise, but you can't afford to incur his displeasure. Uh, this might be all right for a beginner or a little child, but it suggests that God's laws are completely arbitrary and do not make good sense in themselves. That does not speak very favorably of God. Would you, is, is it better to say I do what I do as a believer because God has told me to and I love him and I want to please him? Is that why you don't steal or tell lies? You would see nothing wrong or harmful about doing these things, it's just that you want so much to please God. For some reason, you don't understand why, he does not like it when you steal or lie. And since he's been so good to us, you feel under some obligation to please him. It would only be grateful and fair. Again, this might be all right for a beginner or a child, and I'm seeing I'm running out of time. Would, could we actually choose to do what God asks us to because it's the right thing to do? Is that possible? Could we understand it? Our kind and, kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to, to learn about you each day, to realize what an incredible sacrifice you made for our benefit, the life you lived, the death you died. May we come to understand it better. May we understand the stories of Abraham and, and David and others like them who apparently had that right kind of relationship with you. May we have the same kind of relationship as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.